Quick question. Have you ever felt like as you put together the plans for your life, as you wrote them up, that God took those plans, crumpled them up, found the nearest waste paper basket and said, Kobe, have you ever felt like that before? I know Drake said, when you're writing up the plans or the, your plans for your life, don't give somebody else the pen. When you're writing up the plans for your life, don't give someone else the pen. But you know what? As believers, we know Proverbs 16, 9, which says, we make our plans, but God orders our steps. God not only gives us a pencil to write up the plans for our life, but he has a permanent marker and an eraser. I don't know about you, but have you felt this way in 2020, maybe at the beginning of the year, end of last year, you said, hey, I'm going to go on the dream vacation in 2020. Got it all planned out. I'm going to go here, then here, stay at this hotel and do this. How's that working out for you? Anybody feel that way? Or perhaps you said, hey, in 2020, I'm going to find a new job, and you didn't recognize the economy was going to crash. So again, how's that working out for you? Or perhaps you're like me. I got up Monday morning this past week, set up my brand new laptop computer. I've been on staff at Bayou City for a whopping seven days. And I get an email saying, hey, there's going to be a meeting this morning at 930 with Pastor Curtis on Zoom. And what do I hear? I hear that he is stepping down. Even though in my plans, in my kingdom, in my economy, I had planned out that we would be serving together for years and years and years. And one day we would be sitting in the same retirement home, sitting in rocking chairs next to each other, talking about all the great things that God did in and through Bayou City Fellowship. Have you felt that way before? That again, God took the plans you had for your life, crumpled them up, Kobe, and tossed them in the waste paper basket. Well, my wife and I were in that boat many years ago. Uh, we got married in the second, my la- second to last year of seminary. And we decided that we would wait until I graduated from seminary for us to start having kids. So we got, we got married in the second to last year of seminary. We were going to wait until I graduated to have kids. That was our plan. Crumpled it up. Kobe. We got pregnant two months after we were married. And so lo and behold, before our first anniversary, three weeks before our first anniversary, we were parents. And so we were sitting there because we had committed to having my wife stay at home once we had kids. She was a full-time worker. I was working part-time as an intern for Dr. Tony Evans. We were trying to figure out how is it that my wife is now going to stay at home with our newborn daughter, and I still have six months until I graduate, and I'm making $1,000 a month. And Dr. Evans had told me, he said, hey, when you graduate in May, I've got a full-time job waiting for you, full-time with benefits. So we prayed and said, God, between now and the next five or six months, how are we going to make it? We had our plans, wait until we graduate to have kids, but now we had a beautiful baby girl to care for. And so it was around New Year's that my wife's maternity leave ended, and so my father-in-law called and said, hey, how are you doing? Happy New Year. How are things with a new baby? How's life going? How's Nikki doing in ministry? And so they're just chit-chatting, my wife and her dad. And finally, he asked this question, how are y'all doing financially? And then my wife relayed the story. Icky's making a thousand a month. We've got this little baby girl. I'm going to stop working. We don't know how we're going to make it. And then my father-in-law told this story to my wife. And he said this, many years ago when I was in college, I was getting ready to graduate. And my uh, father-in-law was a college basketball star, but not good enough to be in the NBA. So he began looking for a nine-to-five. He said, I began interviewing all around the country for a job. And he said, I interviewed with a very large insurance company. Went to several interviews, and they turned me down. No job offer. Interviewed with a school district and ended up becoming a school teacher. He actually worked in Spring Branch ISD. Eventually became principal of Hollybrook Elementary here in Spring Branch and Sherwood Elementary here in Spring Branch. They actually lived in Spring Branch. So because he had a job, he thought nothing of that insurance company at all. But he said, this is what happened. Many, many years later, he said, I got a letter from a law firm. And the law firm said, hey, you know what? A class action loss was filed against this large insurance company for discriminating against African Americans. And so he said, with that letter came a large settlement check and I want to give some of, those, some of that money from that check to you so that you can make it for the next five or six months. And so some of you will look at that and say, wow, that's amazing that God would use the evil of racism and discrimination to bring about something good. 
to help support this young family in ministry. And you say, that's a Romans 8.28 moment. God causes all things to work together for good. But you know what? That's not what Romans 8.28 is talking about. Though it sounds good and though it may sell t-shirts and coffee mugs with Romans 8.20 on it, that's not what that verse means. Because the good that we're defining it is based on what we think is good versus from God's perspective and what he calls good. And so often, again, we think in our very individualistic, happily ever after theology that that means my boyfriend dumped me, and because I was so, like, in the dumps, I went to passion with some girlfriends of mine, and there I met the man of my dreams. Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good. I got let go from my job because of COVID-19, and while I was in the unemployment line, I met a guy who helped me start my own business, and now it's thriving. Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good. But again, that's not what it means. So if you would turn to your neighbor and simply tap them, and this is the title of the message, and ask them this question, what's good? I ask y'all to do that. Come on, y'all. What's good? What's good, right? So if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verse 26, we will discover what Romans 8, 28 means. And how it applies to us. We're going to start in verse 26, Romans 8, 26. As you're turning there, allow me to give the context because, again, you can pretty much make the Bible say anything and everything you want if you take a verse out of context. So let me set up the context of Romans. The theme of Romans is this one word, righteousness. And the word righteousness means this. We toss it around a lot. Righteousness means the ability to do God's will. The ability to do God's will. That's what righteousness means. And in the church in Rome, there's a disagreement between the Jews and the non-Jews, the Gentiles, about who is more righteous. The Jews would say, we are because we are the chosen people of God. And the non-Jews would say, yeah, but you know what? You rejected the Messiah. And so they're going back and forth. And in chapters 1 through 3, we find this, that all of us are unrighteous. All of us have the inability to do God's will. But here's some good news. In chapters 4 and 5, he says that now... Because Christ was able to live a perfect life. He did the will of God perfectly. Now Christ is credited to us. And we are now justified. We're declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. But then he says this. He says this in chapter 6. Don't take that declaration of righteousness for granted. Don't live like how you want to. And then he talks about in chapter 7 the challenge of growing in righteousness. The challenge of what we would call sanctification. And then in chapter 8, this is what he's talking about. He says, in sanctification, because it's challenging, he says, God has given you the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. So again, chapter 8 is really about sanctification, us growing and becoming more righteous in two ways, progressively becoming more righteous or progressively becoming more Christ-like, and in ultimate terms, permanently becoming like Christ. And the word there is glorification. That's the context of Romans chapter 8. He's looking at our lives, our salvation from God's perspective. And he says, you know what? God wants you to become more like Jesus Christ. And he gives you the Holy Spirit to do that. But on top of all that, if you look at again, Romans chapter 8, verse 18 says that all of us in here, all of us watching, suffer because of sin. Our sin, other people's sin, all of us suffer. And God uses that suffering as a tool, as an aid for our sanctification. Then he says, right after uh, after verse 18, he says, All of creation, our world groans because it suffers as well. It sees the sin in our world, the brokenness in our world, and creation groans, earthquakes and storms. It groans. And on top of that, I don't know if you can relate with me, but perhaps this week you are groaning with me. We groan when we see the brokenness and sin in our world, and we suffer because of that. And Paul has an amazing alliterative ability. His alliterative abilities are amazing because he talks about, again, sanctification, the spirit, and now suffering. So he says this in verse 26. In the same way, the spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Here's point number one. In the midst of suffering, the Spirit works in us. In the Spirit works in us. In the midst of suffering, the Spirit works in us. He says in verse 27, He who searches the hearts and 
heart, the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So he says this, we're all going to suffer, verse 18, because of sin. But he says, here's something that he wants to share with us in the same way. Why does he use that word, in the same way? Because I believe, he says, creation groans. We groan. Verse 26 now says, even the spirit groans because of suffering due to sin. And I know many people look at this verse and say it this way. They say, when we groan, when we don't know how to pray or what to pray, you just throw your hands up, oh, God, oh. The Holy Spirit acts like Google Translator and translates that, oh, and translates it to God, says, God, look, look at Icky. He's struggling. Be gracious to him. Fill him. Strengthen him, right? That's not what that verse is talking about because of that word in the same way, that conjunction. He's saying just like creation groans, we groan, even the Holy Spirit groans because we don't know how to pray and what to pray. The uh, uh, New American says how to pray. NIV says what to pray. We don't know content or even how. He says this, the good news is the Spirit is working in us. When we hear about our pastor stepping down, when we hear about a loved one passing away, when we hear about somebody who's sick in the hospital, when we hear about someone who's just lost their job, and we do not know how to pray. We do not know what to pray. The good news is this. The Spirit is working in us, and he says the Spirit intercedes. And that word intercedes is only used here in the entire New Testament. Variations are used in other parts of the New Testament, but this specific word is only used here, and it means this, literally the word is a combination of two words to make an appeal on behalf of somebody else. To make an appeal on behalf of somebody else. And here's what the Spirit does. He does it according to the will of God. So even if you don't know how to pray or what to pray, the Spirit both knows how and what to pray, and he prays it according to the will of God. Because the Holy Spirit is God. He says, God the Father knows and searches the hearts, and he knows the Spirit. The Spirit knows as well. So they pray, Spirit prays according to the will of God. So no need to trip, no need to fret, because when you're going through adversity and suffering, the Holy Spirit is interceding. And the Greek there is present tense. It's not just a one-time thing. Right now, as we're here, gathered together, as I'm preaching, the Spirit is making intercession for you and I. I was supposed to do the chapel for the Houston Rockets on Thursday. And then that Tuesday, I believe, the NBA decided to shut down the season. I had my lesson all ready. And the NBA said, hey, we're going to now postpone the season. I was supposed to do chapel for the Rockets. I had my lesson all ready. And then they said, hey, no more chapel, no more games. We're going to shut it down. And so I began to trip saying, how am I going to continue to minister to these players? How am I going to continue to disciple some of these players if it's all shut down? Who do I need to call? Who do I need to reach out to? And then when they decide to restart everything and move into this bubble, I began to have questions. Does that mean the NBA is going to fly one of the chaplains from the Rockets to live inside the bubble for the next four months to be with the team? I began to have questions. I didn't know, though, what to ask or even how to ask it. Should I call the headquarters, the NBA office in New York? Should I ask another chaplain? What should I do? But I did not fret and trip too much because of one thing. Last year in 2019, the NBA sent all the chaplains across the league to Charlotte for All-Star Weekend. And we were there. We enjoyed all the festivities, the All-Star Game, the three-point contest, the dunk contest. We were at all these festivities. We went to a breakfast, met some former players and current players. Amazing time. They put us up in this great hotel. But really their purpose was for training. And at this training... Greg Taylor came. Now, Greg Taylor may not be a familiar name to you, but Greg Taylor is the reason why I don't trip as a chaplain for the Houston Rockets when I don't know what to do and who to ask and what to ask for because Greg Taylor is a senior vice president of player development. And he came and met with all the chaplains. And he says, you know what? In the headquarters, at headquarters, NBA headquarters, you have an advocate in me. You have an advocate in me because I believe in what you're doing. But here's the other thing. Because I'm at headquarters, I'm with the commissioner and all the other vice presidents all the time. So I know the will of the NBA. And so when the NBA says, you know what, we're concerned about the mental health of the players, I can say, you know what, we need to get the chaplains involved. When the NBA says, we're concerned about the marriages of the players in the NBA, I can say and advocate and say, we need to get the chaplains involved. The reason why I'm not worried and concerned is because I've got somebody on the inside 
advocating for me. And you know what? Greg Taylor is a lawyer by trade. He's been trained to be an advocate. And the text here says that in the middle of suffering, Tom Mosley, the Holy Spirit is our advocate. He's always interceding for us. When we don't know how to pray and what to pray, he's constantly interceding according to the will of God. Let's move on. Look at verse 28. And we know, the verse we're looking at, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's the verse. Some have called Romans chapter 8 the greatest chapter in the Bible. And if that's true, verse 28 is perhaps the greatest verse in the New Testament. And we know, and that verse uh, in the beginning says, and we know intuitively if Ecclesiastes 3.11 is true and God has placed eternity in our hearts, when we go through good times, when we go through hard times and bad times, we intuitively know this is not the end of the story. When a pastor steps down, when a loved one goes home to be at the Lord, we know intuitively this is not the period. This is just the comma. The story goes on. What, is, what do we know? God causes all things. Here's point number two. In the midst of suffering, the Father works on us. This is a Trinitarian formula. The Spirit works in us. The Father works in us. We know that God causes all things. If we stop right there, we would go absolutely batty. We'd go absolutely crazy if we stopped and said, God causes all things. Because then we'd begin to ask the question, does God cause racism? Does God cause evil? Does God cause greed? Does God cause cancer? Of course not. But the text here says, though, God causes all things to work together for good. What's the good? Look at verse 29. We've got to look at this in context. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. That word image is the word icon, a picture that we would be a representation of Jesus Christ. That is the good that he's talking about. That word work together is the Greek word synergase, from which we get the English word synergy. God synergistically works, combines everything that we go through to conform us to the image of Christ. That is the good that he's talking about. Can I get an amen from somebody? Can I get a virtual amen from everybody out there? He says, that's the good. And this is what synergy is. Synergy is where the sum is greater than the parts. Instead of being 2 plus 2 plus 2 equals 8, it's now 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 equals 16. God takes all that we go through and synergistically works all those things together to make us more like Jesus Christ, to conform us to the image of Christ. If you go to Washington, the Washington Mall in Washington, D.C., perhaps you've been there and you've seen this statue. There's a statue that out of the mountain of despair is the stone of hope. And you'll see Martin Luther King Jr. with his arms crossed. When they were erecting that statue, there was a bit of controversy because as they're preparing to have this statue on the Washington Mall, they began to ask artists from around the world to send in their portfolios trying to decide who would be the most capable artist of designing and developing this amazing statue. And the winner was a Chinese sculptor by the name of Li Yi Jin. Controversial because they thought, could you not find an African-American artist to sculpt this amazing sculpture of the greatest African-American leader perhaps in the Ameri uh, United States of America? And yet they chose Li Yi Jin. And this is what Li Yi Jin did. Thousands of miles away in China... He got a picture uh, uh, that was made by Bob Fitch. And Bob Fitch was a professional photographer. And he took a famous photo of Dr. Martin Luther King standing at his desk with his arms crossed. And there's a picture of Mahatma Gandhi in the background. He took this very famous photo. He got a big piece of granite. Looked at the image. Kink, 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 kink. Looked at the image. Kink, 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 kink. Looked at the image. Kink, 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 kink. And began to sculpt from this large piece of granite, Martin Luther King. And if you look at the photo and you look at the image, the two are almost identically, uh, exactly alike. They're almost a perfect match. Because he looked at the image and he looked at this granite. And you know what? I don't know. My cosmology is probably wrong. But I believe in heaven, God the Father is sitting there. 
and he's looking at his son seated at his right hand. And then he's looking at Ikisoma, this big piece of granite, this hard-headed guy, and he says, you know what? I'm looking at my son. I'm looking at Icky. Kink, 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 kink. I'm looking at my son. I'm looking at Icky. Hardships. Kink, 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 kink. Trials. Kink, 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 kink. Frustrations. Kink, 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 kink. Molding and shaping him into the image of Christ. And that's what God is doing with us. And here, if you notice, he doesn't use a singular pronoun. He uses the collective plural pronoun. He's doing it to the church, y'all. He's doing it to us individually, making us more like Jesus Christ, conform us to image. But he's also doing it to Bayou City Fellowship. My prayer is that a year from now, we'll be more conformed to Christ than today. But here's some qualifiers, y'all. He says this. He says in verse 28, to those who love God. He just doesn't do this for everybody and anybody. We all go through suffering. We all go through trials. But he says the first qualifier is to those who love God. There has to be a relational love where you to be able to see the pain, the dilemmas, the drama, all that. God is using that to conform me to Jesus Christ. We have to love God relationally. Listen to this. We look like who we love. We become who we behold. We are transformed by who we trust. We are shaped by who we serve. We are patterned by or patterned into who we pursue, and we are formed into who we follow. And here's how love is measured. Love is not measured by how loud you sing on Sunday. And I love to worship. Yesterday I was worshiping as I was running, and I was so overwhelmed by the presence of God, and I was worshiping Him that I was just enraptured in tears. I'm running along, working out, worshiping God, and in tears. And I can't even imagine what people are thinking as they're driving by saying, Bro, if it hurts that bad, just stop running. <laughs> Not knowing that I was in worship mode. But it's seen by this. John 14, 15, Jesus says it this way. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now notice this. He didn't say, if you love me, you'll know my commandments. If you love me, you'll do my commandments. He said, if you love me, the way love is measured is if you keep my commandments. And the Greek word there is tereo. The word tereo is used throughout the New Testament to mean to keep, but also to guard. When a prisoner would guard uh, some inmates, he would tereo. And this is what tereo means. You observe something. And then you make a change in your life based on what you observe. It's like a secret service agent who says, my life revolves around keeping or guarding the president. If the president moves, I move. If the president runs, I run. Everything the president does, I do. And that's the word here. Jesus says, you'll keep my commandments. Your life will revolve around those things. Knowing and doing the word of God. That's how love is measured. And he said, if you do that, you can count on this. God will cause all things to work synergistically to make you more like Jesus. Here's the problem, you all, that I see. I grew up watching uh, bad, badly dubbed, poorly dubbed kung fu movies on Saturday afternoons. Growing up in California, I watched these very poorly dubbed kung fu movies. They'd be like, you want to fight with me? Come at me now. I fight. Like a bird, right? And you're like, man, terrible because the word and the actions don't match up. And I thought about that. That's true for so many Christians. What they say, the word that they have, and their actions don't match up. We have a lot of Christians who have the right words but don't have the right actions. They know the word, but they don't do the word. And then there's others who will do the word. They love their neighbors. They stand up for justice, but they don't know the word. And they have no biblical basis for what they do. What God wants us to do is to know and to do. He wants us to have our life revolve around keeping the commandments of Christ. You can't know the word, Jesus Christ, unless you know the word. You can't love the word, Jesus Christ, unless you love the word. You can't study the word, Jesus Christ, unless you study the word. I'm not saying bibliology that we worship the word. But if we're going to love Jesus, we have to have our lives revolve around as disciples the word of God. Qualifier number two, called according to his purpose. Verse 28, called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? Verse 29 and 30, for those whom he foreknew, he foreknew you, he predestined you, he conformed you. He says in verse 30, those he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. He's talking about from God's perspective, have you said, Lord, I believe you have eternal plan for my life. 
all the way from foreknowledge to glorification. And in between there, to be justified, to be called justified and conformed and ultimately glorified to the image of Christ that we believe and trust that God has a plan. This calling here is not a call to ministry, not a call to pastoring, not a call to missions. He says it's a call to say, Lord, I know you have a plan. You're conforming me to the image of Christ, and one day, ultimately, I'll be conformed to him. That's God's plan. God gets great glory when believers, individually and collectively, become conformed to the image of Christ. Because if the world wonders this, what would it look like if Jesus Christ was the CEO and tomorrow morning they'd see a little Jesus show up in the boardroom? They wonder, what, does, what would Jesus look like if he was a coach or an athlete and tomorrow morning Jesus, a little Jesus, shows up in the locker room? What would it look like if Jesus were in sales? He was a salesman and tomorrow morning a little Jesus shows up in the showroom. What would it look like if Jesus were a professor or a teacher or a student, and tomorrow morning a little Jesus shows up in the classroom. That's why he says at the end of verse 29, so that he would be the firstborn among brethren. Jesus is our example. He's our model. He's our big brother. But what God desires is that a little Jesus would show up tomorrow morning in the classroom, the boardroom, the locker room, and the showroom. And if you're a lawyer or a judge, even in the courtroom, that's what God desires That's the plan that God has for glorifying himself. When a little Jesus shows up, someone who's been conformed to the image of Christ. So again, he says, do you love him today? Do you trust in his purpose, his call for your life today? Both collectively as Bayou City, but individually as well. Um, Interesting note here, that word glorified in verse 30 is in the past tense. And I don't know about you, I haven't died yet. Right? All the other words there in the past tense, be predestined, called, justified, glorified, they're all in the past tense, but none of us in here have died. And do you know why it's in the past tense? Because God is so certain that he will accomplish that part, he puts it in the past tense. Y'all aren't getting it. Let me see, try to illustrate this. When I was in a previous pastor, we had a staff member whose English grammar wasn't that good. And I would ask her to do something in the future. Hey, tomorrow night, can you counsel this couple? And this is how he'd answer me. Tomorrow night will you counsel this couple? The correct English answer is I will, which means I will in the future. He would always answer me this way, done. Hey, you know what? Christmas is coming up. Can you go pick up the poinsettias and set up them on the stage? Done. And I'd say, "Uh, your English is not very good because you know what? Um, You really should say, yes, I'll take care of it in the future. But you keep answering in the past tense. You know what he was saying? You can be so certain I'm going to do it, I'm going to answer in the past tense. And you can be so certain that one day you'll be in glory with Jesus forever that God puts it in the past tense. You can bank on it. God is a promise keeper. So he puts it in the past tense. I'll close with this. My time is up. Thank you for your patience. Bayou City, I look forward to getting to know you. Uh, Again, I had a plan. You had a plan. Obviously, God is conforming us to the image of Christ. Um, My schedule, my routine. I get up in the morning. I do my devotions. After that... Prayer and Bible study, I go for a run. Usually I have a podcast or some uh, worship music, and I'm worshiping the Lord as I run. And I come home, and I make a smoothie for breakfast. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to brag. I'm not trying to brag, but I'm a smoothie master. So I, I'm a master. I've been making smoothies since I was a teenager. When I first started lifting weights, I've been making smoothies for decades. So I am a smoothie master, y'all. I'm a smoothie master. But when I tell you what I put in my smoothies, it may kind of rock your world because they're kind of unconventional. So I start out with some ice cubes. Now, ice cubes are hard and cold. And then to that, my base liquid is not a juice. I actually use turmeric tea. Turmeric is the same ingredient for curry. Turmeric is spicy. It's a bright yellow. It almost looks like urine. And so you're wondering, why would you put this spicy, bitter liquid that looks like urine into this smoothie you're making, right? To activate the ingredients in turmeric, you actually have to put some black pepper. So I put pepper in there as well. So you put something spicy and bitter inside this smoothie that's going to be, because i got a vision, y'all. i got an image of what this is going to be. It's going to both taste good and be good. On top of that, I add some blueberries, some frozen blueberries, which are both dark and cold. And then I add um, some monk fruit to the tea, some monk fruit. And if you've ever seen monk fruit, it's a sweetener that looks like rotten carrots. So people are saying, why would you add something that looks like rotten carrots into the smoothie, something that you have an image of that's both good and tastes good. 
And then I add almond butter for more protein. Now, almond butter is both nutty and it's really like, it looks like mud. Um, I put some greens powder in there, which gives me two servings of vegetable, and it tastes kind of bitter. It's grassy. Uh, and then I put pea protein, which is both tasteless and gritty. And then finally, to this mix, I add everything that we like. I put some honey on top of that. So in this mix, I add things that are sour. I add things that are bitter. I add things that are hard. I add things that are dark. I add things that are uh, uh, rough. I add things that are gritty. And then I add things that are sweet. And I put them in my blender, y'all. And I blend them together. And out comes this image of a smoothie that I had pictured. It both tastes good and it is good for me. And I wondered about that. If me as a master smoothie, as a smoothie master can do that, I wonder what the sovereign master can do with our lives. I wonder what the sovereign master can do with the cold things that come in our lives, the hard things that come into our lives the difficult things that come in our lives, the sour things that hit our lives, the bitter things that hit our lives, the gritty things that hit our lives, the nutty things that hit our lives, the dark things that hit our lives, how God, our sovereign master, can blend all those things synergistically and conform us to the image of Christ to make us individually more like Jesus Christ, but also us as a body, as a church, more like Jesus Christ. So my question to you all today is, do you love him today? Do we love him today, and do we trust him today? Do we trust that God is conforming us individually to become more like his beloved son, our king, our master? Do we believe that God is conforming and molding and shaping Bayou City, this one that we're radically committed to, more like Jesus Christ? If you do, again, my question is, do you love him today, and do you trust him today, that our sovereign master is blending all these things, the sour things, the hard things, the difficult things, and even the sweet things for the good to make us more like Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we do bless you. We praise you. We worship you. We acknowledge you. We love you. And God, I pray, Master, that our love for you would not just be with our lips, that we enjoy worshiping you and singing praises. But Master, I pray that our worship of you and our love for you would seen with our lives, that we would be, as Romans 12 talks about, a living sacrifice on the altar, offered up to you, O oh Master. God, we love you. And we know that you have placed eternity in our hearts. And from an eternal perspective, the mess, the difficulties, the nutty things, the dark things, the frustrating things, the joyous things, the birth of our children, getting a new job, losing a, ju new, uh, losing a job, a medical diagnosis, transitions in ministry, the loss of loved ones, violence we see on television. God, you can cause all those things sovereignly, synergistically to work together for good, both individually to make us more like your beloved son Jesus, our master and our king, but also to make Bayou City and everyone under the sound of my voice who names the name of Jesus Christ to be conformed to become more like Christ, to love like him, to serve like him, to stand like him, to be gracious like him, to be merciful like him, to be forgiving like him, to have his actions and his attitude. So God, this morning, that's our prayer. That we, as a qualifier, we love you. We want our lives to revolve around keeping and guarding Christ's commandments, his word, and to trust you, knowing that you have a plan from foreknowledge to glory for us individually, and for Bayou City Fellowship. So Lord, Master, we yield ourselves to you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said.